Well, hello everyone. It's time for our next installment of Understanding Soul Mechanics Laboratory Experiment. This time we are in for a treat. This is a fun experiment, so we're going to learn a little bit about Darcy's Law and his experiment. Then we're going to get into the laboratory and really experience what he was all about when it comes to understanding the hydraulic conductivity of soil. So, um, we're going to do that in two different ways, a constant head and a falling head permeability test. <clears throat> you can see in the image here that there are, um, uh, there on the left side, you have um, the setup with water at a specific height coming in from a funnel. You can see it's coming in from the sink down into a, um, uh, a chamber with soil in it. And then the, we have an outflow at the bottom where you can uh, acquire the water flowing through, and uh, that's the experiment we're going to perform today. So our learning objectives, just one, we're going to determine the hydraulic conductivity of a soil using two different methods, the constant and falling head test method. There's no ASTM procedure for this, but it is a fairly standard uh, test methodology. There are ASTM procedures for advanced hydraulic conductivity testing using, um, using pressure in a permeability cell or a triaxial cell. Um, but that's not, we're not going to get that advanced in our laboratory session today. So to start off, what permeability really is, it's the flow of some liquid through a porous medium. In our case, we're going to use water, which is mostly what we deal with in the field and, and out in groundwater seepage flow, uh, through a soil, which is our porous medium that we typically utilize. That flow of liquid through the soil is measured by a constant called the coefficient of permeability or the hydraulic conductivity and it is uh, designated by the variable lowercase k. And it follows, and I've talked about this in class, it follows the second law of thermodynamics where energy travels from high to low and in, that, in the case of groundwater flow or seepage, water is traveling from high pressures to low pressure. Um, so the, the, it's just following the, the laws of our universe, of course. Now the question is, why do we need to know this information? What is it's what is so important about permeability that uh, civil engineers engineering students need to learn about this? Well, uh, we should understand when we're designing, especially when we're designing around water systems and um, water resource situations, or when we're uh, in a, from a geotechnical perspective designing levees and dams, or understanding the flow through a system. Uh, for specific purposes of dewatering or um, just understanding the amount of water flow through the ground through the soil um, this is called seepage and for to estimate seepage uh, we must understand how quickly it will flow through the soil and so it, you have a case here where if we have a levee protecting uh, a city or a town uh, we can see that the normal uh, water level of a, uh, of a of a river or a lake or a stream or whatever this is in this case it's a river uh, is at a certain level and as it flows through that levee the groundwater table stays below the ground and everything is peachy but when we have flooding conditions the water level rises uh, it flows through the levee at a different rate and you can see that we could have potential catastrophic failure within the town or flooding or whatnot and that can be dangerous so we want to design appropriately for that. Um, when this happens, when seepage is running through the soil, um, that can change a lot of different variables that are going, that is, is happening. The properties of the soil can change, uh, the amount of, um, uh, of potential damage or erosion can can certainly become an issue and so understanding all of this becomes very very important. Now how do we determine what the um, permeability of a specific soil is? Well we have this guy named Henry Darcy back in France a long time ago in the mid 1800s uh, was designing a water supply system in France and started experimenting with different types of sands as water would flow through. So he created a pipe system with various types of sand packed in at various um, uh, um, void ratios and changing uh, the height at which the water flew in, was flowing in and the water flowing out which changes the head um, collected water over a specific amount of time and created this 
plot that shows that if we have, for instance, in this case, three different types of soil, the proportion of flow, the volume per time, through that pipe changed as the soil was changing. And it changed it changed in a, in a unique way. Each soil had its own way of flowing through. And that flow rate, the amount of water over a certain amount of time, is proportional to the area that it flowed through, which makes sense. The larger the area, the more it would flow through. And the head, so the, the more potential energy in the system or the, the, the difference between the inflow and the outflow head or elevation also uh, affected the, the amount of water flow over time. But the length at which it travels was inversely proportional. All of that makes sense if you think about it. Water's flowing through a porous medium. The more, the longer you have to travel, it slows it down. The larger the area, it speeds it up. More can flow through, and the higher the head, more can flow through. The important thing about all of this, um, uh, this and this plot that was generated, is the slope of that of those lines. The relationship between the flow rate and the change in head times the area divided by the length creates this constant of proportionality of the slope of those lines and that is what we call the hydraulic conductivity. It is a property of the soil that allows the user to understand how much flow or how much water will flow through the soil or how much liquid I guess you could say. So based upon those information, that information on the previous slide, the hydraulic conductivity K uh, equals the flow rate times the length divided by the area times the change in head. But we know that the hydraulic gradient, which is the driving force in any seepage flow, is delta H over L. So that is obviously in the hydraulic conductivity equation. So we can reduce that equation to K equals Q over the hydraulic gradient times the area, or Q equals KAI, which is the Darcy law that everybody knows and memorizes. Okay. Now the important thing here is I want you to notice that Q is the volume over time but that is essentially can be related to the velocity. So velocity is a length over time or a distance over time. If you take the velocity, which is k times i, uh, which is the Darcyan velocity, kind of a made up velocity over an area, then we can see that the flow rate and the Darcyan velocity are related. On the next slide, you can see that as well. So if you divide the flow rate by the cross-sectional area, it becomes something called the Darcyan velocity or the apparent velocity, and that is just k times i. Um, but I just wanted you to relate and understand that velocity is related in this equation, so it allows us to understand that we're looking at a flow rate. We're looking at the amount of volume over a time, and that is directly related to the area that the water is traveling through. Okay. Uh, so based on that, we have some common values here. Here's a, uh, a, a plot from a textbook that shows the standard ranges of hydraulic conductivity for various types of soil. Our experiment today, we're probably going to be somewhere within the range of a uh, of a fine sand to a, we'll probably be somewhere between a silty sand and a clean coarse sand. That's going to be the, the, the soil we're going to utilize in the laboratory. Um, but you can see that based on that information, we should be somewhere between um, 10 to the negative 4 and 10 and, and about 0.1 centimeters per second. Okay. All right, so let's get to the actual experiment. And basically all we're doing is simulating what Darcy did in his experiments. The difference is we have two different types of experimentation. This first one, which is what really Darcy generated, was is a constant head permeability test, which basically allows us to have a constant difference in the inflow and the outflow of our system. So we're going to make sure that we have a constant flow of water through our system down through the soil and we are going to collect the water that's flowing through our soil over a period of time. And this is specifically for a coarse grain soil. As you can see we have the equation on the left and we can easily see that L is the length at which the soil the water is traveling through the soil. The soil has an, a cross-sectional area that it's traveling through as well. We have a volume that we are collecting, the amount of water that we're collecting out of the valve, 
and that is going to be collected over a certain period of time. The only thing we don't uh, that I didn't mention is the delta H in the equation is the big H on the image, which is the difference between the inflow and the outflow. So we need to understand all of that, and during the video I'll explain, and you'll see this very clear. The important thing to understand is this experiment is great for coarse grain material where water flows fairly quickly so we don't have to wait too long to collect water and time it so it's really easy we can do this three or four times we actually do it four times we collect the data for three of them and average together and we can calculate the hydraulic conductivity of the soil very easily real good easy stuff right well now this is real good for coarse grain soils where water flows very easily but for fine grain soils what we've come up with is a way to allow us to determine what the hydraulic conductivity is with uh, without having to wait too long for water to pass through it so for fine grain soils it is it, it, what we do is we alter the experimentation slightly to allow us to uh, to measure the amount of water flow in a standpipe or basically a um, a pipette with millimeter milliliter measurements traveling through and what that does it also allows us to adjust the change in the height or the overall head for the system because as the water is traveling through the head is changing as well as the volume of flow uh, through the system so the hydraulic gradient is changing as Q changes so this creates a partial differential equation uh, which can easily be solved um, by the equation at the very bottom. So we have 2.3 times little a, which is the area of the standpipe. That's the area at which the uh, the water is flowing through in the uh, in the in the pipette, times the length of the soil sample again, divided by the area of the cross-sectional area of the soil sample, divided by the time it takes to have this occur, times the log of h sub zero over h sub one, and those are just the changes in the head, the initial head divided by the final head so you can in this case you have to take two measurements you have to take the measurement of the movement of distance and the amount of milliliters over that distance so if you notice here this is not a time dependent as much as it is a flow dependent time is in there uh, because we are going to in, during the experimentation say we're going to collect water over a say five second or ten second time period that's just immediately inserted in and the changes are the head and the amount of water that's flowing through it okay so that gives us a good indication of how to how to uh, experiment with the constant head and falling head for determining the hydraulic conductivity now we can see the video for the experimentation all right so now we see um, the cell the permeability cell it's all taken apart so I'm gonna tighten up the vertical rods that support everything make sure that I have plenty of paper towels I've got the Vaseline there do you see the three um, uh, quad rings those quad rings are there to uh, install in the bottom of that cell between the two portions of the plastic um, cell pieces and at the very top where the cell cap is being placed on top of that so you want to clean out the groove and make sure that all the particles are out of there it's nice and clean so it makes a good seal you want to get a nice um, measurement, about three measurements of the internal diameter of the um, cell itself, and that way you have an uh, you can calculate the area at which the um, water is traveling through or the soil is being packed into that, um, so you know the area at which the um, so the water is traveling through the soil. Um, at, you can see I've got plenty of paper towels set up, and uh, we want to make sure that the um, uh, the quad rings are nice and clean then we lubricate them to make a good seal make sure no water or soil gets through there at all okay so that's what I'm doing right now it's a pretty easy process we just want to make sure that we do this before um, we have any soil anywhere around our cell uh, for the bottom one and then obviously we build our sample so we place that right in the bottom now some of these quad rings have been um, stretched over time you can see this one here is uh, barely is having trouble fitting in but it will fit in to kind of angle it a little bit next you want to put a porous stone uh, in the bottom uh, piece of the bottom cell bottom portion of the cell that porous stone sits on a, um, a little groove or a lip 
and then clean that up and place that right in there and what you want to do is you want to twist a little bit you can put your ear up to it and twist to make sure that you don't hear any uh, grains of particles moving around and then um, at that point we're ready to make a soil sample <clears throat> in order to do that you take your um, a bulk sample of your sand which you see right here put it onto the scale to make sure you know what the bulk sample weighed prior to making your sample then you create a funnel or something to uh, allow you to pour the material into the uh, the cell without it getting all over the place you don't want to lose any material if you lose material that's going to make your weight of your sample inaccurate okay and this obviously having uh, two people helping would be uh, better and y'all have five four or five group members so this is, should be fairly easy but you want to pour that into your sample now some of that yes will get around the uh, pore stone but for the majority it will not and um, and you place it in in about mm, half inch to three quarter inch layers and then have somebody hold down that bottom piece of the cell the entire time. In fact, that's their job while you make the sample is to hold it down. And then you just even it out. You want to do a little bit of compaction to get the soil to a little more compacted state. When you're actually testing soil from, uh, from a site, you can uh, simulate the amount of compaction of the void ratios for that site um, over time. Once you get to about a half an inch from the uh, top of that bottom cell, then you clean it off really good. Um, you can see I did spill a little bit on the countertop, but I'll put that back into the uh, bulk sample. Clean that uh, top really good. Obviously, you have somebody holding that bottom portion of the cell um, uh, the the whole time, so you'll never let go of that while uh, somebody else does this process. Take your next quad ring, lubricate just the same, and that goes now into the bottom portion of the top half of the cell as you can see right there I've got it upside down I've got the cell upside down on the on the paper towel there so clean that quad ring lubricate it really well and place it into the um, the bottom portion of the upper part of the cell the top part of the cell and again these quad rings I should probably get some new ones they've been stretched over time but they should fit in okay just kinda angle them a little bit so where when you put it down they'll seal up real good Okay, you can see what I'm doing here. It can be a little bit tricky. Once you get it in there, it should stay or stick to that top piece, then flip it upside down to put right into the... Uh, see, I had a little trouble here. Hopefully you guys don't have the trouble that I do here. But it's okay, it's fixable. Place that real gently into the, onto the top of the uh, bottom portion of the cell and then now the person who's holding that can hold the top piece down as well see I have to let go because I have to put more soil in um, but it's certainly uh, something that uh, with you have plenty of people there you can see alright so I get my paper again hopefully you don't have to check your insulin pump like I do and continue to make your sample Again, about three quarters of an inch, maybe up to an inch, and then compact the layer. See the layer compacting there? Now that it's about a uh, half inch, three quarters of an inch from the top, clean the top piece of the of the uh, cell completely. You can place your porous stone on the top of the sample. That should fit right in. That should be about equal with the top. It can be a little above, a little below. That's okay, but as long as it fits into the cell itself. Okay. Then the next portion of this is to take the the last quad ring, obviously clean and lubricate that one as well and you're going to place that quad ring into the upper part uh, up underneath the um, uh, the cell cap and be strategic about the cell cap and where the um, the valves 
are located. I'll show you here in a minute. You flip the cell cap upside down. Uh, make sure that's nice and clean. Usually it is cleaned from the previous, but you want to check it and then put your quad ring in there. Again, the same system there where we have um, the quad rings have been stretched over time because they're sealed up in here. And then, again, you want to make sure that you put this in the right spot. Put the spring on the top to keep everything in place. And look at the location of the valves and how the three uh, the three um, threaded rods come through the top cap and make sure that you go to the right location. It's just convenient. You can see where I have the the vertical. I pointed to that opening. That's where the vertical rod goes when we assemble it later. So you want that to be opposite the vertical rod. And it would be nice to have the um, uh, that valve going one direction away from where that vertical rod goes. Once you have that in place, you can twist it a little bit, make sure it's nice and sealed. Uh, and then you go ahead and put your um, your wing nuts on to tighten everything down. And this is just like everything else. You want to tighten this down to um, not all one wing nut and then go to the others. You want to tighten it like you would your car tire where you go and rotate around. Looks like there's a little water leaking from the, uh, uh, from the valve at the top. We don't have any water in our sample yet, so um, that was probably left over from the last time this was used. Then go through and tighten up all the all the wing nuts nice and tight. doesn't have to be super tight, just nice and hand tight is fine. It should seal up okay if you've installed the quad rings correctly and um, make sure they were nice and clean and lubricated well. All right, so now your sample is made. Um, one thing I did not show you is that you need to measure the height of your sample. You already have the area, but you need to measure your height of your sample between porous stones. Uh, in order to do that, you can you can see that there is a um, a measuring device there on the back side uh, attached to the threaded rod. I'll show you how to do that in the laboratory. Um, and but you need to get the height of that sample for L. Then what you want to do is, as you can see, we've got a um, we've got a funnel that's um, being placed at some height. It's okay what height that is. It's got an overflow uh, tube and that allows you to have a consistent uh, head for your sample. That's why it's the constant head test. And um, once you have all the air out of that line, you can begin to slowly saturate your sample from the bottom up. So you have to open the valves at the top. You open both valves at the top. Uh, before you begin um, the saturation process. That saturation process you want to go very slow because you don't want the soil to begin eroded and hit what we call a critical hydraulic gradient where the soil sample will um, will begin to move like a liquid. You don't want it to flow so quickly that you get the soil to become like a liquid. And what I just did with my fingers is I was showing that all the air bubbles should be rising to the top as the soil sample becomes saturated. We want the air to escape and if you don't have the valves open at the top we're not going to allow that to occur. So you notice this process is fairly slow but it's a good way to um, to evacuate all of the air from the sample. In order to we're in a permeability cell the sample must be saturated. Okay. So I continue to feed water through the tube um, from the bottom up and making sure the valves are um, open at the top and just slow enough to where it uh, slowly works its way saturated through the sample itself. Again, what we want to do is uh, we want to have jobs for each person in your group. Notice how I have the soil uh, or the, the, the cell strategically placed where the bottom valve is over the sink. You want to have one person in your group be the pitcher person. Pitcher man is what I call them, and they f constantly fill the funnel with water so the, so the head in the sample becomes constant. Uh, what we're looking for is the water to begin to flow out of the side tube uh, of the side valve. Once the water begins to flow, you know the saturation is complete. Um, and what I do is I like to open and close the vertical valve uh, just to make sure that air is the air pockets are coming out okay. You want to make sure that that is saturated as well. You can see the trickle now coming through. Um, always keep that horizontal valve open while you do this. And I open and close the vertical one because the air is going to want to travel through. Um, once you get that closed and you get a constant trickle of water th through, um, then you go ahead and close all valves. 
open up the uh, the the tube that comes through from the funnel. Make sure that you have a constant water head, um, so your pitcher man needs to have a constant head coming through the system. Open the valve at the bottom, and then set your timer. And you usually do about five seconds for this uh, soil sample. And you uh, you have the bottom valve open, top valves closed. Open the bottom valve about halfway for five seconds. Close it up. Make sure it's nice and closed. Collect all the water in that tube, and then you pour it uh, into the uh, measuring device. Now, you'll see right here that I do a terrible job, and I spill a little bit of it. Um, that is not what you should do. Make sure you're very, very careful, and then you measure the amount of water that that was collected. By the way, if it was 5.2 seconds, that's what you write. If it's if it's 4.9, that's what you write. And then, by the way, what you want to do is you want to take the measurement. Uh, but you want to do this four times. The first time you actually throw away. You don't use the measurement. It's kind of a practice run. Make sure the soil is saturated, all that good stuff. Then you do the experiment three more times, collecting the water each time, uh, writing down the results, and making sure uh, that you have fairly consistent results. So uh, write down the amount of time and the amount of water collected for three times. Then you do the calculation for your hydraulic conductivity, and um, and you take an average of those values. If one is way off from the other two, then you can do the trial uh, run a, a fourth time and keep that measurement. Now that that is the constant head test. Now what you want to do is um, change the setup to the falling head test. In order to do that, you remove the funnel, empty the funnel and remove it, and make sure that um, that the soil samples valves are completely closed. Uh, because we're replacing that funnel with a pipette that measures the amount of water flow through it. So you'll see here in a second that uh, I'm removing the funnel from the um, uh, from the clamp and then replacing that funnel with a um, with a pipette that measures the amount of water flow in the sample. And you want to put that the bottom of that pipette somewhere above um, the uh, the input because you're going to have a tube running through it anyway but this allows you to measure the head differential in that in that system along with the amount of water flow that's traveling through um, so once you have that pipette at a good height go ahead and put a tube uh, the same tube at the bottom of it. it doesn't have to be in too far and put that tube now and I think in this experiment you can go ahead and put that tube at the top horizontal valve rather than the bottom one. The water can flow down instead of up in this case. It doesn't really matter either way. Sometimes you want the water to flow up through the sample to measure upward flow against gravity. Sometimes you want it to flow down to allow uh, with gravity. It depends on the project that you're working on and the type of um, uh, the, the type of permeability flow that you expect in the field. Once you have that uh, once you have that tube connected, open up that horizontal valve, keep the vertical one closed. Obviously, your the bottom valve is where the water is going to come from. And then what I'm showing you here is the, uh, the measurement now for the amount of volume flow of water through the system is measured through the pipette. But also, that height needs to be, needs to be measured across on that meter stick to make sure you understand the H0 or H1 for your system. So that is your um, uh, your uh, head and the amount of water flow. And you can see here that you probably want to have a taller person uh, do this, or you want to have the water level low enough to where you can make read those measurements. You may have to get up on the on the stool, or just be careful doing that. Okay. So once you have that water level um, determined and the head determined from that water level down to the outflow then you get your stopwatch on your on your phone out uh, go ahead and uh, take a measurement usually about five seconds open up the the valve as water flows through it close it at that specific time take the accurate measurement of what that is going to be uh, and then you take the measurement of the how much water flowed through that sample and uh, the head differential that changed so now you have an H1 um, head height and so the difference between the H0 and H1 and the water level that flowed through the sample is what you put in your equations and you can do this again three times uh, throwing the first one away and do your calculations